Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. We are sitting here in one of Acquia headquarters Boston's media rooms called Symphony. And because it's called Symphony, we've got music behind us. Now, it's not symphonic music, it's actually Bach, but we're going to forgive the room planners just this once on this point. This so. Bach piano music, John Kennedy. How are you today? Lovely. Thank you. You are lovely. <laughs> tell, us, tell us who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Sean Kennedy. I am the uh, product manager for Lightning, uh, Acquia's enterprise authoring distribution of Drupal. It's completely open source. I'm also the program manager of the module acceleration program. So I want to ask you about both of those things. I don't know if you can hear it, but we've got a symphony of police and ambulance sirens going on here right now. That's exciting. John, how did you discover Drupal? Well, uh, I was doing a little bit of work for a non-profit organization called um, Vibewire, uh, maybe back in 2006. Uh, and they said to me, we've got this website. It keeps going down. We really need to have a look, look at it for us. I looked at it. It was on uh, Drupal 4.7, loaded up to the brim with modules. And I said, this is awful, and promptly migrated them to Plone. Um, <laughs> since then. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> since then, I've had some better experiences with Drupal. <laughs> um, I, I ended up running my own Drupal shop for a while. Um, and I then uh, came out to the UK uh, to actually start the UK operation of the Commerce Guys. And I did that uh, for a little while. And then uh, Acquia uh, brought me on to be head of solutions architecture for Europe. And uh, now they've brought me over here. Fill in the blank here uh, between 2006 and 2016. From being a big Plone fan to actually sticking with Drupal all these years, what, what changed for you? I, I don't know that I was a big Plone fan. I was a big open source fan. Um, you know, I'd been a <clears throat> systems administrator and I'd been using, uh, you know, the range of uh, kind of tools on top of uh, Linux for a long time. Um, Plone at the time seemed uh, more mature. I had some developers who I could use for Plone. Um, but what happened was that I found a couple of projects that were really suitable for Drupal and I worked out how to use it. Non-trivial at the time, at least, <laughs> still. <laughs> um, and and then, you know, once I was dug in, uh, you know, I found it more and more useful and I, I, um, I really got uh, kind of in touch with the community. I started coming to Drupal cons. Um, the first Drupal con I came to was Chicago and I hadn't missed many since until I had my son 17 months ago and then I've missed a couple. <laughs> Between Drupal functionality and, and your ability to deliver business value for clients all these years. What's Do you have a favorite thing about Drupal? Absolutely. Drupal creates this role uh, that exists in other ecosystems, but it's really clear in Drupal of site builder. And it's someone who uh, can be but is not necessarily a developer and can be but is not necessarily an author. And they actually create experiences by assembling, uh, assembling modules, assembling functionality, um, and that could be you know, layouts with panels, or it could be, uh, you know, business logic with rules, or it could be a range of other func functionality uh, bringing it in through the module, module ecosystem. And I think that role is incredibly powerful because it allows, uh, you know, little organizations and large organizations to much better leverage their uh, expertise uh, their, to, to build great experiences, to, to build, uh, you know, complicated functionality. Um, it also facilitates this amazing ecosystem of people who scratch their own itch, but also contribute to a wider, uh, wider module of functionality. Um, and it, it's a lot, f it's a lot more, I would say, sophisticated than the module ecosystems you see in things like, you know, with Ruby gems or, uh, you know, necessarily just kind of the wider composer PHP ecosystem, because it actually takes into account that there's an end user that needs an administration interface and needs guidance on how to implement this. It's not just a piece of code that you plug in. It's also, you know, by default an administration interface and and uh, kind of uh, 
you know, general principles that allow it to slot into Drupal really easily. I'm going to try and boil that down. <laughs> what I tell people often in this context is Drupal has taken the incredible power and flexibility of a lot of great code built by a lot of great developers and made a fundamental design decision along the way. We are going to put the power of that code in the hands of less technical end users and make it available to anyone who wants to build community, build a business, and so on. So the fundamental design decision is empower the user interface user and not just the developer. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think um, you know when we think about WordPress, they're, de they're definitely empowering a user. They're empowering an author. Um, but it's really, you know, just an author. It's someone who just wants to publish simple content or, you know, who, who wants to write words or add media. Uh, Drupal enables an expert user. It's not necessarily a coder, but it's someone who has a little bit more knowledge and then can create something uh, really sophisticated. Talk about your role as the Lightning distribution product owner in Acquia. What What is Lightning for? So, you know, the way I like to talk about Lightning is that it's, it's, um, it's not an out-of-the-box distribution. It's a framework. Um, it's a way to cut 20% off any large project that wants to achieve a great authoring experience. Um, you know, our tagline for it is enabling developers to create great authoring experiences and, and empowering editorial teams. Um, it's, not, it's not meant to be, um, you know, a beautiful instant experience like Atrium. It's really meant to be a set of principles, frameworks, code, best practice, documentation uh, that developers can take to, to leverage their time and to not have to think about that core set of functionality around authoring, which, you know, as we define it, is layout, preview, media integration, and workflow. And, you know, within those categories, we do things like, you know, we enable use cases like uh, putting groups of content through a workflow and being able to preview them. So you've got, you know, you can enable scenarios like uh, the, the um, election night scenario or the, the Super Bowl scenario where I might have two or three groups of content uh, that I write and, uh, you know, I want to be able to preview, but only one of them is ever going to get published. And that's that was really hard previously, but we've brought together uh, in Lightning, a few different modules to to enable that, uh, bringing together workspaces and workbench moderation, and a couple of other things uh, to allow for that. And you know, you can do so much more than we've done, um, but by giving you that that little piece, uh, I think we've enabled some really interesting use cases. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are a few of those different uh, things that we brought together. It's really about the fact that we think those four functionalities uh, should be tightly coupled uh, for enterprise authoring. Not all the time, uh, but specifically if you're a large organization with m many authors and you've got a sophisticated auth authoring uh, process, uh, then those functionalities should be tightly coupled because they, they should integrate with each other uh, for that use case. So, so it's a time saver for developers, and I also believe it's an opinion, opinionated way of, of integrating functionality within Drupal. And I imagine, am I right in saying that this will, um, if people apply it, it'll also save a lot of time on maintenance and um, handing off projects between different dev shops because a, a set of uh, universal and good choices has been made along the way? Absolutely. You know, our this is so our internal um, PS team now, when they launch a project, they use Lightning by default. Um, Even if it's not an authoring heavy site, is that what they'll start with anyway? I would say that, uh, you know, Acquia clients tend to have authoring needs, uh, so I don't think Lightning should be necessarily the 80% use case for all Drupal shops out there, but it is for, for Acquia because that's the kind of client we have. Um, I think if you're thinking about enterprise authoring, uh, you know, not just post a blog, you know, in fact, not just, you know, multiple uh, content types and, you know, interesting views. I think I'm really talking about if you have multiple authors and workflows and you need to create lots of different layouts and landing pages and, you know, all these kinds of um, slightly more difficult uh, use cases, then, yeah, you should be thinking about Lightning. And this is fully open source. Where can I get it and how can I make it better? Drupal.org. <laughs> in fact, we are being as transparent as we can possibly be we publish our uh, we publish our uh, all of our uh, kind of release uh, notes but also our forward releases have their uh, their stories 
on Drupal.org so you can go see what we're targeting. Uh, if we've already covered that, the issues, if they're closed, they're going to you know, have the little line through them like they do on Drupal.org. Um, and, and we're publishing as much as we can so that really people aren't just helping us fix problems but influencing our Ford roadmap as well. We want to hear what people want. Oh, that's great. Okay. So you're combining uh, deep technical knowledge and intuition with actual reports from people who do this every day. That's it. What would you say are the top three things about Lightning that makes it really ideal for your targets with it, its use cases? Right. So, you know, if developers are talking to their managers about why they should uh, use use Lightning, the, the obvious ones are the feature sets. So, you know, I talked about that before, uh, you know, workflow, preview, layout, uh, media. But actually what makes this brilliant for developers is a set of principles that we've come up with to build Lightning. Um, one of those is that you never have to undo anything. So, you know, a lot of distributions, you've got to go in and you've got to undo configuration or <laughs> things that they've they've decided upon earlier, and that makes it less useful for you. Um, and, and we've really taken an unopinionated, unopinionated approach so that you can take Lightning and build forward. Um, you know, the next one is... Uh, automated testing, we've built BHAT tests into all of our major functionality. And that means that as you build on top of Lightning, you can actually test uh, whether you're breaking any of our stuff, <laughs> which is which is really useful uh, when you're building you know, an enterprise authoring system. Um, and, and the final one is upgradability. And this is controversial because uh, you know, a lot of distributions aim at this and don't quite get there. But we think by keeping a smallish core of Lightning, we can actually maintain an upgrade path going forward. And that means that if you build on Lightning, you can actually get free features um, as we upgrade Lightning. You know, and you, you, those won't necessarily be turned on automatically. But as a developer, as you upgrade Lightning, you have the ability to incorporate more of this functionality uh, you know, into the experience that you're, you're giving your users. Oh, so so I like the, the the first part of those really react to problems that we've all faced in w one situation or another on the web uh, or in Drupal consulting and um, this idea of the build it forward and and upgradability built into the distro really uh, <laughs> really hits if if you can nail that right that really hits some pain points that uh, I've certainly experienced along the way. Yeah. Cool, great. So so build it forward sounds like a like a, a good uh, yeah. Way to sum that up. It's hard. You know, like what, what we're doing is hard and we recognize that and there'll be a lot of time spent, um, you know, maintaining upgradability and, and those concepts, but we think they're key to the success of the distribution. So we're putting the effort in. Now, it is uh, in real time, it is early March 2016. We've had Drupal 8 for a few months now. Uh, and Drupal 8.1 mm -hmm. is coming up, is lightning. Drupal 8 version already out and ready. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in beta. Uh, you know, I think we're at beta 4 right now. Um, and as I said, PS is, uh, our professional services department is already using our beta uh, for, for uh, you know, building real sites. Um, but we're not going to release uh, our GA version of Lightning until the 31st of March. Um, there's a couple more features we want to put in there, um, you know, things we want to tighten up. Um, and, and actually, we're now thinking about, uh, you know, what that, what that looks like in 8.1 and how we, how we bring 8.1 into our, into our platform as well. So I've been doing Drupal, I noticed, for 11 years. And I figured out recently that a huge percentage of our community has never experienced a new major version release. Drupal 7 was our major version for more than five years. And we, while we did this enormous rebuild re-architecture that has produced something really wonderful, I think Drupal 8 is fantastic. I'm enjoying every moment I use it. Those of us who've been in since 4.6, which is actually, so we've been doing Drupal about the same amount of time, we've seen a lot more releases. And for example, the release of Drupal 6, when it came out, was completely unusable. Every, every Drupal 5 site uh, worth talking about used panels, views, CCK. And at the time, the views maintainer did not want to port views 1 to Drupal 6 and took another six or eight months to port to, to finish views two for Drupal 6. And Drupal 6 was kind of dead in the water for a long time. 
Drupal 7 had really good uptake. It was a solid release. But still, we had this situation where it took, you know, a year for the contributed module space to really, really catch up with Drupal 7. And so I want to point out a couple of things about Drupal 8 that make it a much more usable release than we've we've ever seen before. Drupal 8 was completely and thoroughly tested from the first cutting of the branch and every single patch that was applied. So it's really functionally solid. Um, you can do a lot more with core. Views is in core. Multilingual is in core. Um, it's And it's very compact and like a ton of boilerplate's been taken out. Um, you can make your own admin interface because it's all views. I mean, it's really very powerful and flexible and you can do great sites already now. But there's also a lot more economic value hanging on the Drupal ecosystem for a major release than has ever happened before. And a lot of us, Acquia, community, shops, clients all around the world, don't want to risk Drupal 8 failing as a release, right? And we want this uptake to happen a lot faster. So I think the Lightning distribution coming from Acquia and being used in customer projects already being released on March the 31st sends a signal, hey, this is ready to use. And one of my projects right now is writing the Drupal 8 Module of the Week series, which is also, first of all, I want to celebrate the people who've done this work to bring these modules, to create these modules, to make them available for Drupal 8. But we also want to tell people, hey, use this thing. It's awesome. And you can do, you know, all these different things with it. Your other big project, you're leading the Module Acceleration Program, Acquia's Module Acceleration Program for Drupal 8. You've written some blog posts about it. Do you want to talk about what that is and how it addresses um, what I've just been going on and on and on about? <laughs> sure thing. So, you know, um, we, we did think a lot about uh, Drupal 7's adoption path, you know, and I was, I, I was around and I made mistakes in 6 and I made mistakes in 7 and some of those mistakes were uh, taking on modules early, you know, when they were not ready for release. Um, and I think lots of people being burnt by that process means they're, uh, they, uh, you know, wait a little while uh, before taking up the new major version. What we wanted to do uh, was take the great work of the community and bring modules to production readiness, giving people confidence they could go out and implement them and use the functionality that they would expect in Drupal 7 in Drupal 8. So, you know, Views is in core, so that's less of an issue, but uh, there are a whole range of modules uh, that people use all the time. And, uh, you know, we have um, lots of experience and lots of channels to hear uh, what people need through our clients, through our partners, uh, you know, uh, through, through all of the community members we have in Acquia. Um, and we really ran a process where we looked at what were the top 50 modules uh, that were going to make uh, the biggest impact on, on uh, Drupal 8's usability. And uh, we, we built that list. And that was in conjunction with Angie and a, you know, a range of other people at Acquia. Um, and we, we looked at how do, how do we do that? You know, how, do we, how do we bring them to production? And what we found was that all we needed to do was talk to people who already, uh, already wanted to do them and give a little bit of funding um, so that they could take the time to do it. So, you know, that meant going to some of our partners uh, like Palantir and like Lullabot and in other shops who uh, really wanted to give the time. Um, and, you know, they gave us a, a really low community rate to go and do what they already wanted to do. Uh, you know, we wanted them done, they wanted them done. So you're threading the needle somewhere between uh, what a developer costs in a commercial setting building a client project and the pure volunteerism, which, for better or worse, you know, most of our community wants to contribute. Most of our community community wants to make a difference. But when you've got paid work and volunteer work, the volunteer work happens whenever it can, right? Yeah. So threading this needle, how did you how did you figure out what a what a community development rate was that's good enough to people to focus on on helping the whole community by upgrading these functionalities? Yeah, so, you know, there was already a rate out there that we kind of went by as a, as a rough approach. Um, but there's also people wanting to give their time and just said, look, I, I can do it and this is what I can do it for. And a lot of that time, that was, that was even better. Um, you know, and so, uh, and so we brought that 
group of people together. And, you know, it was made up of maybe um, 11 um, externals who were working on contract for us and, you know, maybe another five within Acquia that were um, that were doing work um, just as part of their 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 jobs. And then um, maybe another five to 10 from the community who had uh, parallel projects that had needs for these modules and actually just needed to get these done. And, you know, what we did then was we helped coordinate all those people. So we started running, you know, our internal scrum was daily, but then we had an exter external scrum, which was weekly. And then we broke out and had a workflow scrum so that those people who were really interested in that could gather around that. And in fact, we, we kicked a lot of this off at the... Um, the, the, the summit that we had at Bad Camp last year, uh, where we br brought together uh, one subgroup of, of the wider group, which was around authoring. Um, you know, I was really interested in how lightning was going to get done. <laughs> and a lot of other people were interested in how, uh, you know, other parts of authoring were going to get done. And so we all got together at Bad, Bad Camp and came up with the, the kind of the needs for this authoring experience. And that fed into a lot of what we built as well. Um, but it was really, you know, um, a lot of community engagement, a lot of going out and uh, talking to the maintainers of modules and working out, uh, you know, whether they had the time to 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 actually uh, do the ports themselves or whether they could uh, share maintainership or whether they could uh, support an effort, you know, whether they could uh, do, um, you know, patch reviews and things like this for our, for our contractors um, and our, our contributors. Um, and I think that was a lot of the gold in the project. You know, it, you know, it was great to get uh, great rates from people and great to, to work with lots of the community, but that coordination effort mean, meant we just steamed ahead um, in terms of getting modules done. And I don't want to take credit for, you know, I don't, I don't think even the program should take credit for doing whole module ports. We took a lot of code that existed in porting, but what we did was we got it production ready. You know, we got it out there. We got it to the beta. We got it uh, so that people use it in projects. So one of the things that I've been really proud of over the years uh, uh, being part of Acquia is where the rubber really, really hits the road, Acquia has gotten open source right. And and especially on the contribution side, the first thing we the first thing Dries did was hire Gabor to get Drupal 6 out the door in the best shape possible. We um, worked with really early versions of Drupal 7 when I was in, in, in engineering building Drupal Gardens. Um, and we made some big mistakes around module upgrades at the time. Um, and we've learned from that and have apologized, I believe, <laughs> uh, uh, along the way. But um, when the rubber hits the road, Acquia uh, has done a lot, an awful lot of things that have helped uh, the entire project and our community. I'm really, really proud of that as a Drupalist. Um, in this case, and as you've written in the in the blog, uh, Acquia has invested 500000 US dollars in these upgrades. And, you know, frankly, the fact that we get production ready modules and our community gets some more rent paid, I think that's a great outcome for everybody. Where does, how do you think this, this investment is going to, you know, what's the return on this investment going to be for us and, and for, for Drupal? We talked before about how uh, a complete module ecosystem accelerates Drupal. I think the the big return that we'll see is people coming into Drupal 8 earlier. Uh, so existing Drupalists, but also people who are evaluating Drupal, uh, seeing the functionality ready and getting onto Drupal. And we'll see that curve, uh, that exponential growth that we've seen in 7, we're going to see that earlier. Um, and that's the that's the big return. That's I think you know what keeps us all up at night is uh, is let's see the 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 big acceleration of Drupal 8. Um, I think we already saw, I've, I've seen some early stats and there's some really good news about what Drupal 8's doing um, in terms of if we look at the um, the path of Drupal 7, it looks like we're, we're actually double the amount of sites at the same stage. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Um, but, you know, what we saw over um, over a long period of time, uh, you know, was this, this um, about 76% year-on-year growth of Drupal 7. Um, and, you know, that, brought us from a, a, a community uh, that was already significant to one that ran 3% of the web. Um, it was huge. And, uh, you know, the the 35,000 odd active contributors now, you know, a lot of them came on board in that cycle. And we really want to see that happen again. Um, we're going to bring back the excitement to Drupal. And, um, you know, I think Drupal is, is great at a lot of things. And uh, it it's still really relevant in this day and age where we are looking at, uh, you know, 
more and more sophisticated use cases for uh, for authoring and for uh, web applications. And if we want to create a world where regular people can create great experiences, not just developers, uh, Drupal is a fantastic uh, application for that. Well, thank you for coordinating all of this. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Now get back to work and make Drupal 8 production <laughs> ready. Sure thing. <laughs>